um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce two uh, colleagues. Uh, we're linking up between London and Washington today. In the US, we have Robert Williams, who's the chair of the Committee on Antisemitism and Holocaust Denial at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IRA, and he's also a member of the steering committee for the German Task Force on Holocaust Denial, uh, the subject that we're covering today. Also in London, we have Mike Wine. Uh, ordinarily, he, um, he works for the Community Security Trust, uh, but he is also a UK member of the European Commission Against Racism and Tolerance. It's a standing commission that advises the Council of Europe member states on human rights matters. And he's also advising on one of the aspects of the German task force on Holocaust denial. And just before I hand over the floor to them both, I should say that I, um, I see Rob a couple of times a year at IRA meetings. And I also see Mike in synagogue. Um, but I'll leave you to guess which one of them I see more often. Um, with that, I will hand over to Rob and to Mike. I hope the event goes well, the conversation. We will be on hand. Hopefully that we won't have any technical issues. And we'll uh, come back in about half an hour or so. And we'll start to think about taking some questions. Rob and Mike, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Um... We'll uh, unmute Mike, uh, if somebody could unmute Mike for the discussion. There we go. So um, thank you for having us. It's, it's always a pleasure working with, with AJR and, and with you and Alex in particular. And, and Mike and I are old friends at this point, so I always enjoy talking to him. Uh, Mike, I, I think maybe the easiest way to start off would be to address uh, something that, that you've recently done. You just published an article in the Israel Journal of Foreign Affairs that gives us some guidance on ways that we might and ways that institutions and governments are countering Holocaust denial. So a couple of questions to kick things off. First, what motivated you to write this piece? And, you know, in your article, you outline some very disturbing trends, you know, what are these trends and what are you seeing in the wider world? Well, the short answer to question one is you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going there, but sure. <laughs> For the benefit of AJR members, uh, Rob and I sat together 18 months or so ago at a conference at Indiana University, and he pulled out uh, a copy of an article I had published uh, in 2009 on Holocaust denial, uh, and said, it's about time you uh, renewed this and updated it. Um, so, uh, I blame you. The fact is that uh, in 2008, um, Cambridge University uh, Faculty of Law hosted um, a, an international conference with leading lawyers uh, from around the world and academics uh, to look at extreme speech and how democratic societies were dealing with extreme speech. And uh, I was invited uh, by the co-chairman to deliver a paper on Holocaust denial and legislation. That was published 2009 uh, by Oxford University Press. Um, in the interim, um, as, as has been said, I work for Community Security Trust, CST, and uh, we, in, apart from our security work, we also look at uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic threats, political, physical, uh, and act accordingly, uh, usually in concert with government and the police. So although Holocaust denial has not been a major component for some years uh, in our research work, it is something nevertheless that we look at. So when I published, or when Oxford University Press published my paper in 2009, and it's in a book called Extreme Speech and Democracy, uh, I uh, noted that at that time, um, within the European Union, uh, something like half the member states had banned Holocaust denial. Uh, this was a consequence uh, of two bits of legislation, the 2008 uh, EU framework decision, 
uh, which required all e European Union member states uh, to criminalize incitement to hatred and denial of genocide, including the Holocaust. Um, a couple of years prior to that, in 2003, the Council of Europe uh, had uh, issued a convention on cybercrime to which was added an additional protocol uh, doing pretty much the same thing as the EU framework decision. In other words, uh, requiring member states to criminalize online Holocaust denial. And cut a long story short, uh, by the time I published, 50% of states had done so. The second or third point that I made was that at that time, uh, Iran, the government of Iran, was funding Holocaust denial directly through a series of conferences held in Tehran and indirectly, uh, working primarily with, through Arab states, Muslim states, but also with extremist groups like the extreme right neo-Nazi groups. Uh, my fourth uh, finding was that the scientific, the so-called scientific, the pseudo-scientific argument for Holocaust denial uh, had been destroyed as a consequence of David Irving's failed legal action uh, against uh, Deborah Lipstadt. And my last point was that despite all of this, education uh, would lead inevitably uh, to a reduction in, in Holocaust denial worldwide. In my book, and it's 20, uh, more than 20 years now since I wrote that, uh, that, that chapter in that book, um, the situation has changed. Um, outright denial uh, has declined uh, primarily because of legislation, because of cases, court cases, that uh, states have brought against deniers, uh, and some of which have gone to the European courts and been upheld there. We can discuss that. Uh, but that, at the same time, we've seen an increase in the distortion of the Holocaust narrative, that people use, they don't now say six million Jews didn't die or there was no Holocaust, they might say, well, uh, Jews died, but they may have died because of uh, epidemics in the camps, or that what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians uh, is equal to, if not worse, than what the Nazis did to the Jews. In other words, it's distortion and obfuscation. Uh, another finding uh, is that there are lots of new players. Um, initially, Holocaust denial was promoted by neo-Nazis and those seeking to resurrect uh, the, the, the Nazi regime and the Third Reich, particularly in the early post-war years. And many of the early cases uh, that dealt with Holocaust denial were against uh, neo-Nazi activists who were seeking to resurrect the Nazi regime. Uh, so there are new players, and they're not all by any means extreme right. Uh, my next finding is that uh, in the, uh, the internet provides probably the primary vehicle for promoting Holocaust denial and distortion. Uh, th although the main platforms, Google, Facebook, and so on, are beginning slowly to deal with it and to boot off their platforms, people who deny, uh, deny the Holocaust, there are lots of other new players uh, in uh, cyberspace. The fringe uh, websites, the fringe social networks, uh, and they, uh, they've taken over in, in that sense. So those are my current findings. There are others which we can discuss, but let's yeah, well, leave that I, I, particular point. I think in a few moments I'm going to ask that we pivot to the issue of distortion and look and dive yes. a bit deeper into that because honestly in its many ways as you hint a, a much more pernicious form because it kind of acts like a gateway drug to other hatreds. Um, but before we go there, you know, in your article and, and in some of your work as well, you know, you dive very deep into the Middle Eastern context, something, a region of the world that I spend way too much time in Eastern Europe, so I don't have time for the Middle East. But, you know, I'm hoping maybe you can characterize for us what you're observing there, because it seems like the dynamic is, is shifting somewhat. And, and you know, do you have a sense of what's behind that shift? Is it cynicism on the part of the Saudis? Is there is there something bigger at play? I, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see what you, what you think. <laughs> it, it could well be cynicism on the part of the Saudis and some of the Arab states. Um, 
I think there are several different uh, factors at play here. Uh, firstly, they've seen uh, that there has been widespread condemnation of Holocaust denial. Mm -hmm. uh, the UN General Assembly resolution on Holocaust denial was supported unanimously with the exception of Iran. Uh, secondly, there have been other UN General Assembly and Secretary General um, publications which focus on Holocaust denial. You know, while states may be prepared uh, to go up against the UN, it's not good for their reputation. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Iran has moved away a little bit because it's preoccupied with other things. It's preoccupied with trying to take over the Muslim world, particularly the Middle East. Uh, it has its rivalry with Saudi Arabia. It's a Sunni-Shia divide, which has become violent, not necessarily directly, but certainly using proxies. Um, they've got other things to deal with, uh, so they're no longer in the game. But that doesn't mean some of the others, and also, of course, the, uh, uh, the chief cleric at Al-Azhar University uh, wrote to the director of your museum, mm -hmm. essentially saying, uh, we think the Holocaust denial is a bad thing, uh, and uh, we will no longer be involved in this game. I mean, that was a significant, uh, that was a significant statement, uh, because Al Azhar is the leading theological institute uh, of the Sunni Muslim world, and for uh, it's it's like the chief rabbi or, or, or somebody. I mean, at even a higher uh, level, uh, if you like, uh, saying Holocaust denial is bad. Uh, there's also recognition, as we're seeing in recent weeks, that the Arab world is putting the problems with the Palestinians to one side and is beginning to face up to both recognition of Israel and dealing with Israel. And you can't be consistent mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that you, or rather you can't be so inconsistent in both promoting Holocaust denial within the Arab Muslim world and trying to reach out to Israel. So there are all these factors. Nevertheless, we still see it. And in the article, I quoted recent examples. For example, the Palestinian leadership uh, continues to promote Holocaust denial, even recently. Despite all the problems they've got, they still uh, try to distort the, uh, the, the known facts uh, of the Holocaust um, and compare their situation uh, to the Jewish and other victims. Uh, of the Holocaust. Uh, Mohammed Mahathir, the former uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia, a long time Holocaust denial, continues still uh, to promote it. Uh, but nevertheless, we are beginning to see a diminution within the Muslim world. Of course, they took it up in the first place, not just because um, of uh, what had happened uh, 39 to 45 and subsequently in 1948, but because they sought to undermine one of the uh, key factors in the foundation of the State of Israel, uh, that is that it provide a haven for the victims of the Holocaust. If the Holocaust hadn't happened, the victims wouldn't have needed a homeland to go to. So these, this was their reasoning, but all of that is falling away. Uh, and that's why we've said and we've seen that there are other players now. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think, important and, and to note for the audience, and, and in a few moments, I think I'll dive into the distinction between denial and distortion because it gets a little fuzzy. But one form of, call it distortion, almost denial, that seems to have been exported out from the Arab world uh, into other forms, primarily on the political left, has been these cartoons. You know, the Iranian government sponsored a series of cartoon contests, which were supposed to poke fun at or lead to the denial of the Holocaust. And we see a lot of the, the people who participated in these cartoon contests also providing content to movements like the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement or to other far left movements where they draw inappropriate comparisons to the Holocaust or frame the Holocaust as something cynical that's used by the Jewish diaspora. Uh, can you Talk about how that is a form of distortion and why it's so tricky to to deal with it on, on a legal in, in a legal sense, at least in the European context. Well, dealing with it in a legal sense is difficult because it's not outright denial, right? Uh, and therefore, 
doesn't so easily fall within the legislation, the European or national legislation. Bearing in mind, of course, that European Union member states are now required to legislate against outright Holocaust denial, where the Holocaust is, is denied with intent uh, to incite hatred. That's an important additional factor. Right. Um, I think uh, what the denial movement, particularly that uh, being pursued or promoted by Iran, falls rather easily into the post-colonial situation. Um, and some of the cartoonists involved uh, didn't come from Arab states or European states. They came from Latin America, for example. And this fitted in uh, quite closely with their post-colonial, ah, yeah, we've got some here, uh, their post-colonial uh, arguments that, uh, that European states uh, had colonized uh, the third world, if you like, Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and had introduced uh, attitudes, uh, had taken on attitudes, which the third world, if you like, was trying to throw off. And this was part of the post-colonial argument. There's one mm -hmm. raging in Germany at the moment, which probably most AJR members are not aware of, but I think, Robert, you may be, which is Achille uh, Mbembe right. uh, from Cameroon, a highly regarded uh, sociologist who's held chairs at prominent Ivy League American universities, is now at Ritz in South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, who argues uh, that um, the treatment of the Palestinians is akin to the treatment uh, that the Nazis accorded the Jews. And he fits this into a, a post-colonial framework. Um, so we, we could we could debate that. I, I, I Mbembe, Mbembe scholarship is a little more nuanced than the press. Is it is a little bit, but the thing I read the other day uh, focused on that, and then yeah, I began yeah. to reset. But anyway, uh, we, we we shouldn't digress too far. No, no, so, it's too too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, it fits into this to this world, into this extreme leftist world, where facts are manipulated to fit into uh, philosophical views and ideologies. And I think that's, that's an important thing to, to discuss with, for the group. You know, when we, as you said earlier, denial itself has fallen into decline. It's almost become a micro phenomenon, at least within the Atlantic world. So that would be North America and, and most of Europe. It's not something that is, well, it doesn't gain a lot of cachet. It's something that is become extremely fringe, but distortion is clearly on the rise. So what do we mean by distortion? You know, within the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, everyone knows, I think, about the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, at least within the UK context, because of all the controversy surrounding it a few years ago. Um, there's also a separate definition that links to that one that's focused on denial and distortion of the Holocaust. So when we talk about distortion, we're really talking about at least five things. Intentional, intentional efforts to excuse or minimize the Holocaust, including the roles played by collaborators, minimizing the number of victims in a egregious way. There are academic debates, was it 5.7 million, 6.1 million, but we're talking about people who say that you know, only a couple hundred thousand died. A third form is blaming the Jews for the Holocaust. This is something that we see increasingly in Eastern European contexts uh, through the revival myths of Judeo-communism. Uh, some people cast the Holocaust as a positive event and others blur responsibility for these crimes. Now, distortion is a problem, as we said earlier, because it does kind of act like a gateway drug to more pernicious forms of anti-Semitism. Um, it's also trickier, as Mike said, to prosecute under a number of these national laws because it's hard to impugn motive. You know, it's hard to, and it's also hard to say, is a person distorting the Holocaust because she or he is simply ignorant, or are they doing it for cynical, ideological, political, or other means? Um, it's also tricky because it's not just restricted to the far right or the far left or one religious ideology or over another religious ideology. It, like anti-Semitism, is something that is shared across all spheres. And then finally, particularly again, to return to the Eastern European case, 
the Holocaust has become an object, a subject of competition. There are what we can call memory wars happening in a number of post-communist countries in particular, but not exclusively, between the crimes of the Shoah, the crimes of the Soviets, or in the, in the Balkan context, the crimes of the 1990s, and these competitions for victimhood, for, for what frames a national, uh, a national identity, have led to forms of distortion and denial to gain a certain legitimacy in political and public discourse. You see this particularly uh, in, in countries like Ukraine and, and Poland and increasingly in Serbia uh, and Croatia. So dealing with this is, is an incredibly complex phenomenon. I'm wondering, since you are so heavily involved in the Council of European, uh, or the Council of Europe space and, and the work that they're doing to try to kind of turn the tide. Do you see any cause for optimism? Is it going to get any better or is it going to get worse before we can really turn the corner? Uh, but it's certainly in um, some Central Europe, Central and East European states and the Baltic states, this is still a raging argument. Uh, that's what uh, the Nazis and their local collaborators did uh, was uh, no worse uh, than what the Soviets did in their occupation. The particular bone of contention is, at the moment, is how those collaborators are dealt with. Because in many cases, in some of these, in many of these countries, they are seen uh, as heroes, people who helped overthrow, firstly, who resisted the Nazis, um, oh, sorry, collaborated with the Nazis, but helped uh, the, 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 the Soviets. Uh, so they are therefore national heroes in helping to resist or leading the fight against the, 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 uh, the, the, the Soviet invaders. And I think that is something that is unlikely to die out for some time, if only because there are still collaborators left and their families, and in many cases, they are honored uh, with national marches, that through Riga, for example, the mass held in Sarajevo uh, last week or the week before. Uh, no, it's like five days ago. Yeah. Of Ustashi. I mean, that is something that's been going on for years, but it has never taken place uh, in Sarajevo. It's always been across the board in Austria because they were afraid uh, to do it in their own country. Well, yeah, only only because of the coronavirus pandemic. Or did they, <laughs> no, I mean, that's the reason maybe, they moved it. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, I don't see that diminishing, yeah. uh, in, at least in the short term. Um, what I have taken some encouragement from is uh, two things. Firstly, the Prague Declaration, mm -hmm. uh, where those countries occupied by the Soviet Union, the majority of them, came together to issue... Uh, the, the Prague Declaration, I can't remember the date, you'll remember it, uh, but it was some time ago now, uh, in which they pretty much committed themselves to uh, commemorating uh, the, the, the Soviet uh, invasion and occupation of their, of their countries. And where the side uh, argument was that what the, the Soviets did was, was, was as bad as uh, what, what the Nazis did. Uh, you don't hear, at least I don't hear that very much. Um, the other thing is that, and what uh, Michael didn't say, is that um, some months ago I was elected within the Council of Europe to lead a working group um, to renew the general policy recommendation on anti-Semitism. I have to just digress for a moment. Um, the Council of Europe is the standard setting agency for Europe. It's the oldest of the European agencies, founded in 1949. Uh, hosted by Ernest Bevan when he was foreign secretary, but very much the brainchild of Winston Churchill and Charles de Gaulle. Uh, and it, the idea was to create a human rights driven uh, governance for Europe. And we have the, uh, the Parliamentary Assembly uh, and we have the European Court of Human Rights and the Council of Europe owns all the conventions, all the standards and the case law uh, of the European courts. So um, in 2007, uh, they, uh, 
publish a, a policy recommendation to governments, which essentially is guidance to governments on how they legislate against particular issues, how governments deal with it. And they did one on anti-Semitism. Well, nearly 20 years later, it needed renewing. So I was elected to chair this working group. Uh, there's only six of us. Um, it's multinational, multilingual. I'm the only native English speaker. Out of the six, two of us only are Jewish. The others are not Jewish, um, but they are prominent human rights champions. They're either high court judges or they're professors uh, of international law. So it's, it's an expert group. And obviously within the framework of our policy recommendation, we are advising governments uh, on what they should legislate. And there's been no argument whatsoever about the Holocaust denial issue. Uh, the draft chapters on this policy recommendation have gone through um, really without too much comment. I mean, we're still at the drafting stage. Um, we have to finalize it, we have to do recommendations. It has to go to our colleagues, then has to go to the Council of Ministers, and then has to be discussed with European Commission, European Parliament. You know, it's an 18 month process at least. Uh, but I will say that uh, not only has there been uh, little discussion about the draft, uh, the drafting of the, uh, the paragraphs on Holocaust denial, but also there has been uh, virtually no discussion on trying to create the false equivalence between the Soviet occupation uh, of East Central and Eastern Europe and the, and, and the Holocaust. Yeah. So I take that really as uh, a very positive point. Well, there, you know, I, we only have a few moments left, so I want to talk very quickly about this rehabilitation issue because it's, it's a particular focus of, of a lot of the work that we're doing. And just to give everyone a sense of how large a problem this is, the most recent case that, that is relevant, there is one ongoing right now in Romania, but as recently as January of this year, the Supreme Court in Slovenia annulled the sentence uh, that was given out to Leon Rupnik. Re Leon Rupnik was the not SS, uh, the Slovenian SS commander in Ljubljana. He oversaw the province of Ljubljana, Slovenia, in cooperation with the Nazis during the war, and was tried in 1946 by a Yugoslav court, found guilty, and hanged. Well, the Supreme Court in Slovenia overturned this conviction in January. The reason for it was a couple of technicalities in their mind. They saw the Yugoslav court as invalid, so let's, let's throw the sentence out. But what this ends up doing is legitimizing the image of a person like Rupnik in the body politic and in popular culture. We've seen the same thing happen in countries like Lithuania, where as early as 1991, they were similarly annulling sentences that were carried out against persons who were complicit in Nazi crimes. <coughs> The scale of this is so vast, I'm just going to share something with you quickly, assuming that it, I can do this properly. There we go. So this is just a list of names. There are about 87 names on here from across, the, from across Europe. So we're going, that's Hungary, here's Italy, that's Latvia, Lithuania is coming up. These are all names of persons who have either been officially or unofficially exonerated for their crimes and these were all individuals who were either direct collaborators with the Nazis or integral to regimes that were allied with the Axis. The, the scale of this is so frightening that we are beginning to work, how do I shut off, oh, stop sharing, there we go. That we are pushing to work with a number of partners across Europe and North America to build the education necessary, the resources necessary, to kind of stem the tide of this particular form of distortion and denial. So we can talk about education maybe during the question and answer session, but I, I'm hoping that we can also talk about the fact that this is not just a European problem. I think there's a particular need, and mind you, I come from the United States. I work at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, so there is a bias uh, in my saying this, but I think that this is a problem that really requires some transatlantic cooperation in order for us to solve. Let's face facts. At the end of the day, the majority of these internet servers where forms of distortion and denial are uh, most, well, they're the voice boxes from which it emanates, 
Most of those internet servers are based in the United States. We have deniers and distorters and neo-Nazis and far, people on the far left and everyone across the spectrum making use of the fact that we have greater freedoms of speech in my home country than in most European countries. So we need to, and this has become this, you mentioned David Irving earlier, David Irving moved to Florida for, for a reason. <laughs> you know, um, we have a, a problem in the United States of, of a rise of persons who will distort or deny the, the subject of the Holocaust and the very fact that there is an online space allows them to have to create these international networks that really spread from Estonia to Florida and beyond. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Estonian intelligence services raided a uh, neo-Nazi network that was started uh, outside of Tallinn. Uh, it had members in uh, across Scandinavia, across the United States, and it was run by a 14-year-old boy. So, you know, the, the very fact, these are not issues that are unique to one particular country. These are issues that, that transgress borders and, and we need to cooperate. I'm wondering if you see any potential for that either in the short term or the long term. Present politics aside, you know, the, it's not just something that the Council of Europe can solve. Do you think the United Nations has a role, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe? Is there, is there any body that has the teeth to tackle this? Um, nobody on its own has the teeth, uh, but increasingly issues are dealt with uh, multilaterally by the mm -hmm. different agencies working together. Um, and certainly uh, the OSCE is about to restart uh, its training for police uh, and prosecutors uh, on anti-Semitism, the words into action. Uh, series uh, are, which take a long time to set up because mm -hmm. the OSE has to sign a memorandum of understanding with the government uh, and all of that takes time but essentially that is training for police on recognizing and investigating anti-semitic crime and uh, I've been involved in this right from the beginning and we're now talking about three new country training sessions uh, in the in the upcoming autumn uh, and where I certainly will inject uh, something of the discussions uh, into this. Um, I think that there are a couple of uh, emerging um, facts which will help. Firstly, there was the Council of Euro or the European Court of Human Rights uh, case, the significant case, um, uh, Delphi versus Estonia, uh, which held, which upheld uh, the, um, the Estonian High Court's decision that it is the service provider, the network that is held responsible for criminal content on their on their website. Um, secondly, the UK, one of the first cases heard before the British or UK Supreme Court was Simon and Shepherd, where it was held that where the uh, send button is pressed is where jurisdiction lies. Simon mm -hmm. and, Shep uh, and Shepherd had relocated their host to California, but they were publishing Holocaust denial and anti-Semitic and indeed anti-Black and anti-Asian uh, websites uh, from Hull, uh, Northeast England, but they uh, re relocated their server to California and the Supreme Court held that that didn't make any difference. The crime was committed and the jurisdiction was valid where the send button was held, uh, was pressed. Um, I note in my article that Facebook is the first of the social networks to begin to face up to the problem uh, of Holocaust denial. The others have yet to do so but I think it's, it's coming, I think it's coming. I think they recognize increasingly uh, the, the problems, but it, it, it behoves all of us to continue to exert pressure on them. Over the course of six trips to Silicon Valley for one day meetings, the British government sent me and a senior British policeman uh, to visit uh, all of the, uh, the networks, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and so on, uh, to argue with them uh, about their hosting of 
uh, incitement. I mean, we were arguing about anti-Semitism. There are others that we invited later on uh, into these meetings. And initially, Holocaust denial, they just didn't want to hear any arguments at all. It's all free speech. Uh, but gradually, they began to recognize the threats, public demonstration, if you like, uh, of the harm committed uh, by incitement to hatred. And they're beginning to change. And of course, the European uh, Accord, uh, whereby civil society organizations complain and report their findings uh, to the European Commission, I think, is, well, we know that it's had a significant effect on mm -hmm. their hosting of, of hate sites and hate messages. And now, as I say, we've got Facebook beginning to recognize that this is the case with Holocaust denial. Yep. I hope that with continued pressure that the others will do so as well. So I think we, we will see a diminution. Of course, that doesn't preclude the fact that all of these messages will move to the periphery of the internet. Well, that's, where and that's we, the challenge, yeah. I mean, you know, we've, we we've seen- find ways. Yeah. We will find ways. Yeah, yeah we've seen this. Um, so again, I, I work at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. We have about 35 million people that use our website every year. So we are the largest online presence for qualified Holocaust content. About four years ago, we were being outstripped, uh, beaten in terms of online polls by uh, stormfront.org, which is kind of a clearinghouse for all of these hate sites, a lot of Holocaust denial, a lot of outright anti-Semitism. Uh, Google, you know, and I do occasionally advise Google YouTube on, on some of these issues, but Google changed their algorithms slightly so that these hate sites are no longer in the top 10 when you do certain keyword searches on Google, that has now led to a situation four or five years after the fact where we are finally beating these hate sites in terms of web traffic. So there is an effect when these internet companies do decide to take action. I think that that's a positive sign. But as you said, there are, uh, evil always finds a way. You know, not to sound like I'm, I'm from Jurassic Park, but you know, the, the, the bad way uh, can always, can always find, find a gap. And, one of the bad actors aren't always these lone wolf organizations. And then I will turn it over to Q&A because I've seen a couple of hands go up. It's not always these lone wolf actors. We are seeing, I think it's clear, increased attempts by certain governments, primarily but not exclusively the Russian Federation, to make use of online media to sow disinformation and distortion of the Holocaust in order to really throw brickbats at former Soviet states, especially the Baltic countries. And this means that we're not, because it's in, written in Cyrillic <laughs> and, and nobody, if it's so, so few of us read Russian, unfortunately, I, I, I think I'm one of, I was the only person in graduate school that actually had Russian. Just, I mean, it's, it's harder to access, it's harder to understand for these monitoring bodies. And it takes place on platforms, not Facebook, but the Contacta or OK.ru and, you know, Dealing with the Russian aspect, but it's again, it's not just Russia. There have been similar operations by other Eastern European countries. Makes this very, very difficult for us to tackle. But with that, I think maybe we'll, we'll ask our AJR colleagues to, to moderate a few questions and see how it goes. Rob, um, Mike, thank you very, very much. That's fascinating. Uh, we could, as you say, just let you carry on riffing between the two of you. It sounds like two chaps in a bar having a catch-up and a drink talking talking. Work. We do it every year or so, and we've been doing it for probably 15 plus years. Quite a long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's great, and it's really fascinating stuff. And of course, there's ever a contemporary angle to this. So it's really interesting listening to what's happened going back a decade and also obviously the current trends. Um, we did say at the beginning, we're going to try now with some, with some Q&A. Uh, I think my colleague Alex has yep. been I, I, watching. Um, we have a, a couple of people who are uh, raising their hands. Uh, I see Lillian Black. Lillian, did you have a question? I, I can unmute you. Go ahead. I think there's so much here to think about. Uh, first of all, uh, Robert, uh, I'm Lillian Black and also Michael. Uh, I'm called Lillian Black and I chair the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association. And we've, uh, we've built 
and we've opened uh, a new Holocaust exhibition and learning center uh, in the north of England, which uh, the AJR has kindly partially supported. And a big thank you to Judy Cohen at the Washington Museum oh, for, for finding a photograph of my auntie uh, who mm. perished. Uh, and we'd never seen it before. So that, that was really great. It, it's just that you've raised some really, really important questions. And I think as educators and in terms of visitors, mm -hmm. we are getting uh, this distortion coming through in the minds of, of young people who are questioning the, sky, the, the, the size, the scale, all the issues, the definitions of, of distortion that you went through, uh, number one. So there is a challenge for us in terms of actually how we encourage open debate, but how we actually educate. Mm -hmm. and, and very quickly, the other issue which Michael knows about uh, is that I, this year, had a really difficult situation uh, as part of the planning process within a, a, a big local authority where we had uh, the Ukrainian Society of Britain uh, mm -hmm. insisting on the Holodomor being on the platform for Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, and I have to say, uh, I had big discussions with Michael about this, uh, but ultimately there was no effective organization that could actually advise guide me so mm -hmm. anything you can do that establishes a body of expertise support guidance and we can get this through our education mm -hmm. programs i am up for this big time because we we're, we're facing it at grassroots level so thank you for for both of those comments and i'll pass that along to judy she'll be pleased to hear that um Let's start with the Ukrainians, uh, since that, that, that's part of my, my sphere of, my, one of my portfolios, actually. Um, it, it's very, very complicated. I, I would actually turn to another Commonwealth country for some guidance, uh, that being Canada. Uh, in Canada, oh, there's, yeah. an or, there's an organization called Ukrainian Jewish Encounter that wrestles with these issues on a regular basis. And, you know, we've seen this elsewhere where Members of the Ukrainian diaspora try to have the Holodomor included in discussions of the Holocaust. Now, the Holodomor, for those who don't know, was the uh, Stalinist-induced famine that claimed the lives of millions of, of Ukrainians during the 1930s. It was a horrible, horrible tragedy, but it was completely separate from the crimes of the Holocaust. Um, the Holodomor deserves recognition and commemoration and research and study and education on its own merits need not be compared to a different form of mass atrocity and genocide that being the Holocaust. And in terms of dates, there are plenty of dates at which commemoration of the Holodomor can take place. There are memorials to the Holodomor. There's one here in Washington, DC actually. Um, but there are memorials all around the world, but there are separate phenomena. And so I would, I would contact Ukrainian Jewish Encounter and see if they have particular guidance that could be brought to bear. I think the, the fact that there's a, a much more, um, well, the fact that culturally speaking, Canadians are more like the Brits than, than, than the Americans might, there might be a little, a little more sensitivity than, than what I could think of there. Um, concerning uh, distortion through youth, uh, yeah, it, it becomes very complicated. I would encourage you to engage in dialogue with Michael and with Alex, uh, the, both of whom have, have considerable experience on this front. But that said, you know, I think it's important when we're dealing with youth audiences to take into account a few factors that you know, my generation or our generations you know, generally didn't have to wrestle with. Today, we also, on top of all the disinformation that's happening online and the very fact that media has become so instantaneous and has to be absorbed in sound bites, you know, 180 character sound bites, we are also living in a world of general denialism. It's not my term, other scholars have come, come up with it, but we have climate denial, science denial. I mean, heaven help us, we have people who think the earth is flat. And you know, in this environment, 
where facts have somehow become subjective in the minds of so many young people. We have to figure out ways to make youth become better consumers of media and engage and connect to subjects in a deeper way. It's very hard for anyone, much less a young person, to wrap their mind around the death of six million people. But what they can engage with are, and AJR actually has a number of really good resources for this, are the testimonies of the survivors. Are, this, are these individual stories? Because it makes that one-to-one -one connection in a way that, that can bring somebody into a subject in a much deeper way and, and, and no longer question it. Uh, but when they're confronted just with numbers or with horribly graphic photos, or just, frankly, the old style of teaching where you're focusing on the crimes of the perpetrators rather than the experiences of the victims and the survivors, it, it leads to a different dynamic. Yeah. Can I yeah, just that that is something? actually, that's helpful because that is our approach to learning uh, right. within our center. It's called through our eyes. So it's that. through the eyes of the victims. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Mike, do you want to add a quick comment? Add, yes, um, there are new um, educational tools uh, which are focused particularly on young people. And I'm thinking of the, uh, the series of teaching aids published last week uh, on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust uh, by the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, it has a human rights subdivision called ODIA, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. And together with UNESCO uh, and the University of Derby uh, in England, they have uh, published a series of teaching aids on different aspects of anti-Semitism. Uh, anti-Semitism in the Middle East, the Holocaust, how do you deal, how, how do you deal with um, these things, particularly uh, for young people? Uh, and I would recommend those. And if you can't easily find them, uh, then uh, I can send the, the link to Michael and he can pass it on. But they deal uh, in a much better, I think, contemporary way with some of these big issues. The numbers, six million, you can't relate to six million. Uh, as Rob said, you can relate to a family, you can relate uh, to um, a small number of people, but six million is beyond comprehension. Yeah, yeah those are really good. I was looking on my shelf, I guess, I guess I left them at my office downtown. Those are really, really good resources. I think some, some of your colleagues at the University College of London were also involved in the creation. Yeah. I was on the advisory body for that yes. project. Really good work. It's really good. Yeah. Work. Thank you, thank you both, and thank you, Lillian. And um, Tom, Tom Connolly. And then Alex, can we unmute? Yep, <clears throat> good. Um, I come from Hungary, that's why I was during your four, and in case either of the speakers needs some additional information about distortion in Hungary, I would be happy to supply that. But uh, really for, for me, the, the one bit of uh, contribution I would like to make, probably more in direction of, of Robert, I talk a lot to schools about my experiences and it's very effective. Uh, I hope it's not only my, my view of that. And there is something you said about the US youth being influenced by, by some of the counter propaganda or denial. What worries me about the US from statistics I have seen is that there is a vast proportion of American youth who don't even know about the Holocaust, never mind uh, being, uh, being misled by, uh, by uh, the Facebooks and Googles and, and, and that kind of thing. So I think there is a, a huge arena where, uh, I don't know if it's UN or US organizations could do something to introduce Holocaust education in the US. In, in England and in Germany, I believe it is very effective. I don't know about the rest of Europe, but in the, U, in the US, could, could something be done there? It's a vast, vast area. Yeah, there, there are a couple of, of factors to, to bear in mind. In there have been a few studies over the last few years. There's one each year. Um, 
organized by the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany to assess exactly what you just talked about, that being levels of Holocaust knowledge and awareness in the general population. Fortunately, um, you know, the, the U.S. did not score as badly as France or Austria uh, in these surveys. In France, it was really striking that levels of basic Holocaust awareness are so low. In the United States, though, you have to take into account proportions. And if you're talking about 20% of the population, I can't remember what the figures are, so I'm just making up that 20%. Let's say it's 20% of the population that don't know any of the basics. I'm sure it's much larger than that. Well, 20% of 300 million people, it's a lot of people. I mean, it's larger than most European countries. It's, so as a result, there is a never the, any percentage is, is too great, and there is a need to do more. Now, on that, on that front, there are some complicating factors that are perhaps unique to the U.S. structure um, as opposed to a number of European countries. We, because we are a republic, leave education at the discretion of the individual states and territories. So we do have a Department of Education, an education ministry, but it cannot set educational policy for the whole of the country. So there have been efforts to mandate Holocaust education in every U.S. state. I think there are 13 or 14 states that have it at this point. Um, but nevertheless, in the, four, uh, in the 50 states of the United States, Holocaust education is taught at the secondary level in 49 of the 50 states. The only one that it is not taught in is North Dakota. I'm not quite sure why. I've never been to North Dakota. But um, there are efforts to enhance this. Just a few weeks ago, the U.S. Congress passed what's known as the Never Again Education Act. This is an act that uh, allocates an additional several million dollars uh, to my home institution, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, to deal with this very issue, to ensure that there is greater and more effective education of students in these basic facts, and that this education is not just the teaching of facts for the sake of facts, but that it helps operationalize individuals to, to engage with these issues in a more meaningful way. The other thing that we are doing more and more, and I'm hoping that we can begin working with European partners on this on a much greater scale is not just training secondary school students. Because you have to remember, teaching secondary school students is an investment in the future. It's the hope that they're going to remember something 10, 20, 30 years down the line that will flip a switch so that they act in a better way than our forebears. Well, that's a big gamble. Right? I had two years of ancient Greek in high school. I don't remember a word, <laughs> right? So you need, if I had taken ancient Greek in college, if I had to continue to engage with the subject, like I did with Latin, heaven help me, um, then I would, you know, I would retain it. So you need to make sure that education continues across an individual's lifetime, whether it's at a technical college, at university, through adult education programs, through the creation of museums and memorials and exhibitions where it's, it becomes a frame of reference that people engage with on a regular basis. And that is what we're trying to do, not just within the US context, but also with our European partners. Because when you educate adults, you're, you have the potential to deal with the problems of the moment, not the problems over the long term. So we're, we're, tr we're trying to address this and, and we're aware of it. Um, I think the bigger challenge, if I may, is that to a certain extent, um, when in the Unsurprisingly, the United Kingdom has always been a very good partner to the U.S. in this matter. Um, but when the U.S. doesn't play as active a role building partnerships and, and multilateral partnerships across Europe on these issues, on other issues related to cultural diplomacy and what we would recognize as our shared belief in, in certain liberal democratic rights, things go, well, I'll, use, I'll, I'll use the U.K. term, pear-shaped very, very quickly. Uh, and, you know, we need to make sure that we continue to engage in dialogue and working in concert, I think, in order to deal with this in an effective way. Thank you. It is also worth adding the, uh, here, the teaching guidelines adopted, teaching, guidance for teaching and learning about the Holocaust adopted by and introduced by the IRA here, which you would hope would disseminate, uh, cascade through to the educational organizations throughout the member countries of IRA which are further resource that can be used to help spread awareness effective education as well. Um, let's move on. We've got a question from Dolph. Yes, good, <clears throat> good afternoon. 
Um, I want to ask something about uh, what I would call soft revisionism. In other words, revisionism, which doesn't mean to do any harm, but nevertheless um, distorts historical facts. Uh, two examples are um, the, um, well, one example anyway, is uh, the boy in the striped pyjamas, which in the UK is used in schools. And I was talking to someone the other day who was talking to a teacher and saying, that's not really what happened. And the teacher was horrified. Um, so nobody's meaning to do any harm, but nevertheless, I think it does do harm. How would you deal with that? Mike, do you have a view? Um, well, I've not read the book. Um, I know that my sons have. They've, they've read most of these books uh, that are meant for children about the Holocaust or aspects of it. So I can't comment on, on that book. But certainly um, there has been an attempt to, if you like, glamorize the Holocaust, to glamorize aspects of it, uh, and in doing so to distort it. And there's any number of television programs and films currently in circulation which do this. I think uh, those involved in teaching about the Holocaust just have to keep on uh, raising their voices uh, to ensure that an accurate portrayal as possible is made of the Holocaust. But the Holocaust was so vast. Uh, I mean, there, has, there, there will never be a complete compilation of everything that happened. I've just read a book on what happened in Warsaw that led up to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, written not by a Jewish person, uh, by an American who was the Herald Tribune uh, and New York Times bureau chief successively in Warsaw for many years, who spent 15 years um, writing uh, about the Holocaust uprising, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, and the, uh, the, 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 the general Warsaw uprising. I, in that book, which I only finished a week or so ago, I learned things that I had never read before. You know, the, the, the complete circumference of the Holocaust from 1930, well, the Holocaust, of course, was only a limited few years, but certainly from the Nazi era from 1933 to 1945 was so big that it's very, very difficult to portray it accurately because there are so many different perspectives. Um, but I go back to my first point. I think those that know about, uh, about this and are upset if a book attempts to portray something in a, in a distorted or soft fashion, then it's up to them to, to make their voice heard, to contact the publishers, the film producers, whatever. If I could just tack on to that very, very quickly. I think there, are, I think it depends, listen, historical fiction has its place you know, in terms of it being a literary form that, that people can engage with. And at times, historical fiction can be a mechanism by which somebody becomes interested in a subject. So, you know, I, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater, but there are certain texts, certain works that do portray things in a way that I, I would say is slightly problematic and not true to the very fact that there was such a breadth of experiences during during the course of the Holocaust and the associated crimes. So the boy in the striped pajamas, for example, is a good indicator of this because that's a work where, you know, in a certain sense it's written and the film version is the same way so that you only become truly engaged and, and sorrowful when you learn about the death of the commandant's son alongside his Jewish friend in the concentration camp, right? So it only becomes, a, you, the emotional tie kind of really comes in not with the murder of the Jewish children, child or the people in, in the camp itself, but with this non-Jewish person. You get a similar dynamic at play when, with an over-focus on Schindler's List, although that's much more historically accurate, although Oscar Schindler was not well, he was, he was a good man at the end of the day, but you know he had his flaws. That does not come through in the film. But again, it's this Christian savior narrative. The problem with certain aspects of this is that they affirm 
an old myth that surrounded our early understanding of the Holocaust, namely this myth that Jews went like lambs to the slaughter. We all know that there was a diversity of experiences and reactions and responses by all the various Jewish communities <laughs> in Europe to the crimes that were being perpetrated against them. So if the historical fiction or the particular memoirs that are being used are so narrow that you only get a very small sense of what happened rather than the breadth, then it becomes problematic. You know, it, to use a, another historical source, uh, it's too far away for me to grab, the Diary of Anne Frank is, generally speaking, one of these gateways to our understanding of the subject. But the challenge of that particular work is it's the perspective and experience of a German-Dutch girl. It's not the Eastern European experience. So you don't get a sense of what happened in Eastern Europe. Or if you only do an Auschwitz memoir, you don't understand what was happening on the killing fields in Ukraine and Belarus and Latvia. I mean, you know, each, by focusing solely on one single experience, you lose a sense of the scale. And that's, at the end of the day, my biggest concern. So we need to make sure that when we educate, that we are educating about everything that we can. You know, that it was the very worst to the very best of humanity, the very worst obviously being the crimes, the best being the roles played by those who resisted or rescued, and everything in between. And so if we're, if we're only looking at it through a pinhole, that's really where the problems can come in. Let me just also quickly bring in uh, my colleague Alex, who of course is a Holocaust educator and has some familiarity with this terrain. Alex, do you want to yeah, add something? Sure. Um, thanks, Michael. So many interesting points raised here. I wanted to just touch on two things very quickly because I know we need to wrap up. One is just um, going back to, uh, I think it was Tommy's point earlier um, about uh, uh, now I'm forgetting what, what it was. Oh, Hungary. Uh, sorry? Hungary. Yes. No, no, there's something else. I, 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 had, I had a thought about it. But um, the point about, um, about the boy in the striped pajamas, it is worth saying that from an educational uh, point of view, it is very much the, the, the standard uh, set of principles that are put forth by all of the major institutions in the UK and globally that, that train teachers, uh, that the emphasis should, emphasis should be on, on testimonies. Um, and obviously there are many people here on this meeting right now who, you know, who go into schools. Um, Tom, you mentioned you do, uh, and I see many other faces, Eva and so many others who do this. And there are so many uh, written uh, testimonies, audio and video testimonies. The AJR has our own Refugee Voices archive that there isn't really a need to rely on Holocaust fiction for historical purposes. I do take Rob's point, absolutely, that there is a place for Holocaust fiction. But um, the problem is that when the fund, you know, the boy in the striped pajamas starts with a, a fundamental uh, premise that if that is what begins your understanding of the Holocaust, you're learning about the Holocaust, um, it, is, it, it, is, it begins from a place of distortion. So one of the other key principles that I think is showing a, uh, represents a shift in the way that the Holocaust is taught to teachers right now is that this needs to be cross-curricular. Obviously the Holocaust needs to be grounded in history, but there are so many other ways in which uh, young people might, and I say it in speech, exaggerated speech quotes, learn about the Holocaust through other subject areas, whether it's English or art or music or film or psychology or whatever else, that it's important to ensure that there's a whole school approach to teaching about the Holocaust so that the English teacher, if they do, or if they are required to teach the boy in the striped pajamas, it's not, uh, it, they don't feel as though that they need to just teach it as though it is factual, that maybe they can use it as a critical exercise where they can encourage students to ask questions. I remembered the point I was gonna make at the outset, which is the one about uh, young people in the US not knowing very much about the Holocaust. And given that it is my, you know, my whole life's work is to educate about the Holocaust, uh, this may sound a little bit strange coming from me. Obviously, I'm very committed to ensuring that the young people do know more about the Holocaust. However, I also always caution people against sort of moral panic when we see headlines that say X percentage of young people have never heard of Auschwitz or anything like that. Um, 
not just because you know I don't you know I, I don't trust statistics or something. Obviously, uh, empirical research is is very important, but I think that the Holocaust is very often singled out as a subject that holds uh, that we uphold to a standard that we don't hold any other topic to, and that's um, I think that's not fair to teachers. It's not fair to students, and it's not fair to the Holocaust. So um, I just think it's important not to to get too weighed down when we see those sorts of headlines. Great, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I think we're going to have to call it a stop there because we've gone over our time. Uh, but I really, really wanted to say a big thank you to Rob and to Mike for finding the time in your schedules to squeeze in this event and to bring some illumination uh, for our members and also it's really great that they've had the opportunity to ask questions directly uh, and I'm just really grateful that you've uh, been able to do this so thank you very much on behalf thank of you. thank you for having us it was a pleasure thank you